Hello, my name is Laurel Ruma. I'm with O'Reilly Media. We're here today at Strata Conference in Hadoop World 2012 with Wes McKinney, the author of Python for Data Analysis. Wes is also the CEO and co-founder of Lambda Foundry. So Wes, why did you choose Python for data analysis? Is that your favorite language? Well, I think Python has definitely become one of the most important languages for, for data analysis and data science over the last few years, along with, along with R and um, a number of other languages. So I was, uh, I was working in quant finance at the, at the time. So my background is as a, as a quant. So I guess quants are data scientists who work in finance, mm -hmm. I guess you could say. And I was using R at the time, and, and there were some things that I liked about R and some things that I didn't like. And I think I was really drawn to, to using Python uh, as, a, as a general purpose language because it's very, very concise and readable uh, and easy to use. And you, it's easy to communicate your code to other people because it's not hard for them to read and understand your code. And I saw that there was a robust uh, scientific, com scientific computing community in Python, but there wasn't kind of the rich layer of data analysis tools that you have in R and other uh, more domain specific languages. Um, so I kind of wanted to, to build those things for, for Python, which is how I got involved with uh, building data tools um, in Python, in particular the, the Pandas project. Uh, and so that's been going on for almost, uh, going, on, going on five years now. Oh, wow. And, uh, and that was, you know, sort of, as part of my open source work, writing the book was, uh, was I guess it's been a continuation and uh, not quite an end result of all of that work because the, work, the development work is still ongoing, but certainly an important step along the way in building a, a concise resource and um, sort of um, compendium of knowledge about uh, scientific computing in Python and more, uh, I guess, you know, more relevantly, uh, data, data analysis and data science. So what would you say to someone who is in the R world or some other language and is coming over to Python? How, you know, what are some tips and tricks they may need to know? Well, I think there, there's, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of R idioms that, that translate very, very naturally to, um, to, to Pandas, which is, uh, which is the library in Python, which has, uh, I guess, which has the same kind of data frame concept, sort of spreadsheet-like data structure. And there was a lot that I liked about R, and I, I took a lot, of, a lot of R's features and brought them, brought them into Pandas. So there are some things which work uh, a little bit differently. Uh, there's sort of a, a, a concept of, of indexing, which is built into to pandas data frames, which is very nice when working with um, irregularly indexed data, time series data, cross-sectional data, you know, various statistical data sets, because it sort of removes a lot of the data munging, data alignment headache that you, um, I often, I experienced when, when I was using R, and that was part of my, uh, part of my motivation in or, you know, building a new data analysis tool in Python. I think you know if people are looking to, to migrate to Python or do more Python who have experience in R, I, you know, I think the book is a great place to start. And I was intending it for um, people with domain domain knowledge in data analysis, so not necessarily looking to learn about data analysis, but they want to do more Python and want to have a good place to start. And there are a lot of great great books uh, about general purpose Python programming, but not necessarily uh, specifically focused on um, sort of data wrangling, data munging. Um, sort of grouping, summarizing, and, and aggregating data. Um, so I think the book is a great place to start, and there's definitely a vibrant community of scientific and scientific programmers and data scientists using Python. So uh, getting engaged with the community uh, and, and sort of you know, taking advantage of the sort of books and resources that we have now uh, would definitely be the, the way to go. So do you have friends back in the uh, quant field that are now using their, your book a bit more, trying to move over from R? Or? Um, so definitely uh, Python and Python and Pandas and NumPy. Well, NumPy is the array, um, the fast array library for Python, and Pandas is built on top of that. Uh, so Python in general has become very popular in in the finance community over the last over the last five years. I, I think when I uh, I was working for a company called AQR, and we started adopting uh, Python there in 2007 and 2008. And I think. Back then, it was a, a little bit, a little bit avant-garde. Whereas, you know, using Python nowadays has become sort of a language of uh, a language of choice. And so, I've seen you know really significant uptake in in Python use in uh, in the financial world. And I think um, you think having the book available will make it a lot easier for organizations to to make more of an investment in in Python and in open source generally, because there's here's a resource that somebody starts on on day one and they can work through the uh, work through the book and the examples. And you know, get up to speed on all the tools rather than having to, you know, um, dig around in five different um, open source documentation pages. 
So I'm very excited about, I guess, the impact that it will have you know, on the financial community, but also generally on people doing statistical computing and data analysis generally in, in Python. What are some of the, your favorite projects that you're seeing out there? I mean, maybe even at the Lambda Foundry, like, what, what are, what's kind of catching your eye then? So I guess our, our, our core business focus right now is in, is in advancing the state of the art in, in data tools for, for Python. And we're all, um, so my co-founder is a, is a former quant, um, and so we, so we, have, we have a little bit of a tilt toward, toward the financial world, uh, but we're, I guess we're interested in the kind of the broad spectrum of, of, of data analysis problems in, in Python. Um, there's, there's a lot of really interesting work happening, uh, happening right now in Python. Uh, a really cool project that's going on, being sponsored by uh, a new start, another startup, Python startup called Continuum Analytics. There's a project called Numba, which uh, uses the LLVM um, just-in-time compilation infrastructure to translate Python code into um, LLVM, so you know, JIT compiling Python code and generating very, very fast um, numerical data processing. And so that's something that you know, I will certainly look to, to leverage as soon as uh, as soon as possible in, in my work. And so it's really great to see so much so much work happening in, in data tools in Python right now. I think you know the general trend of um, you know kind of the big data movement and uh, sort of you know increased interest in uh, you know data science. That uh, there's there's a lot more development resources being being invested um, in Python, of course, everywhere everywhere else in, in uh, data tools. Well, so, I mean, are you seeing a lot of open source uptake then, or just kind of is Python the main gateway drug? Well, I think, yeah, um, I think definitely the most successful mainstream open source language uh, for, for data science has been R, uh, without a question. And I think, I think Python right now is still a little bit of, uh, still a little bit of the underdog, uh, because R has an established base of uh, statistics libraries and, and a lot of academic researchers they publish their publish their papers along with an associated R package which implement, implements cutting edge um, algorithms. But in the last few years, Python has really caught up um, quite a bit in terms of statistics libraries and and especially in machine learning. The Scikit-Learn project um, is really an outstanding outstanding uh, and um, very um, the development team is ex extremely good. It's a main machine learning package for Python. So if you look in the Kaggle competitions, the number of the top contenders have, um, and I see on the mailing list and on Twitter, um, it's, you know, people like to say, oh, who's using R, who's using Python and scikit-learn? So it's a bit of a competition in, in data tools and, and a point of pride to you know, win a Kaggle competition using, say, uh, you know, uh, say scikit-learn. Um, so I think you know, R and Python are definitely two of the most, uh, most popular open source languages for, uh, for data science, and that's um, you know, of course growing all the time. There's the naturally the, the the Java sort of JVM stack and the JVM languages Scala and Clojure um, and Hadoop of course is JVM based and um, that ecosystem is is of course booming and that's all open source uh, open source technology and here at Strata we've seen um, we've seen the open sourcing of you know significant significant new projects um, in, uh, in in data processing the Druid project from MetaMarkets and Impala from Cloudera so it's a very exciting time. Um, in open source, because I think there's more and more of a more of a recognition that that building um, that releasing something in o as open source uh, is is a good thing to do and, and creates a lot of value for for the community broadly. But I think you know five ten years ago, I think releasing something as open source was more of an admission that something's not worth anything. Whereas now, uh, people are releasing you know open source um, pro uh, open source software and and platforms because they want it to be the thing that people use and to sort of you know win mind share. Uh, and so I think there's more and more uptake in open source in the industry as a result. Well that's certainly really exciting. Um, so could you talk a bit more about pandas? I mean how did you come about this and why did you want to do it? It's so, really your So so my my initial um, I guess my initial use case with, with pandas is I was working with large large heterogeneous collections of time series and um, cross-sectional data, so cross-sectional data is data at one point in time, and uh, so I was going going a bit crazy having to you know do all the data munging and data alignment, and I had a bunch of irregularly indexed data, and I want to throw it into a table, uh, having to do that alignment by hand. And I wanted a tool that kind of understood you know how you know did a lot of, did a lot of the uh, data alignment behind the scenes. So that was kind of Pandas point zero zero one, you know, uh, almost five years ago, and since then I've it's developed to kind of span the spectrum of um, 
of you know, standard kinds of, uh, you know, say of data processing algorithms, sort of re data reshaping, data grouping and aggregation, so it's easy to, uh, if you have a, a large structured data set, you can group it by you know, one or more keys and apply, let's say, a modeling function to it, and you get back a result that's very easy to work with uh, and reason about. So, and a lot of the Pandas development has been focused on, um, on building good APIs. So it's not necessarily <coughs> focusing on the on the container or the low-level data structures. I mean that is important too, but it's more about it's more about the human interface and how the how the, the data scientist or the person working with the data how they what they type and what they um, what you know what are the steps that they need to take you know when they're sitting at the command line or in you know in their uh, in their IDE to to get the job done. So I've spent a lot of time thinking about you know what are productive. Um, APIs and a user interface for working with structured data. So that's been a lot of the the, threat, the the focus of the Pandas development is that in some sense it's created a, a domain specific language which lives within Python. It's implemented in the Pandas library for working with uh, for working with data. So if you've created this custom library, <coughs> how do you actually customize your own like computing environment? What do you use? What's your stack? Well, I'm a, I'm primarily a, an Emacs user, uh, so I uh, do most of my code development in Emacs, and I I make heavy use of the IPython project, which is an interactive um, shell uh, computing and interactive um, computing and development environment. So those are kind of my two tools, Emacs and Emacs and IPython. So IPython, where I run uh, sort of run code, explore the results, uh, do debugging, profiling, uh, timing, that sort of thing. Um, I also make, you know, when talking about code and teaching code, I make a lot of use of a uh, very exciting project that's within IPython, which is called the IPython Notebook, which is an HTML web application. You can spin up a notebook that runs on EC2, you know, running on a, on a really big machine. Um, you can control a cluster of, of, uh, of nodes, you know, from within the notebook or, with, you know, within IPython. So it's a nice environment for for you know, exploring data, creating and sharing analysis. It's very similar to you know, Mathematica, Notebook. Um, there's also you know, the R Cloud project you know, from AT&T Research. So there's a lot of, I think everyone's kind of converging on this like com you know, computational notebook that lives in the cloud. And I think it's a great tool for um, you know, reproducible research and collaborative, um, collaborative work um, on the web. Um, so I guess, you know, you know, of course, lots of other tools in my, my you know, Python stack for you know, testing and uh, code coverage and all that. So, and then so. you run Linux on your Mac, then, huh? That's your platform of choice. Uh, well, I I have a I have a Mac laptop. I, you know, you can tell when you go to a tech conference because you look out at the audience and it's just a n nothing but you know Apple uh, Apple laptop. So I I'm portable on a, on a Mac and at home I have uh, I have Ubuntu desktops. Ah. So that's where I do uh, when I'm working at home. I'm on I'm on uh, I'm on Linux. Uh, but I think I think it's valuable to be on both environments because you know if there's if I if I didn't do Mac if I didn't do Mac at all you know the way that um, library management and sort of the, the environment um, you know because it's a different flavor of Unix uh, or Linux um, on the Mac. So it's good to use both you know for development. So I you know know that I'm not creating problems for Mac users or for Linux users, vice versa. Definitely also test on Windows because there's a heavy you know, user, you know, still a lot of, you know, a lot of Windows users. I mean, that's the that's the majority of the market, and um, you know, having everything, you know, work well on Windows is important as well. Um, package packaging and deployment in Python can occasionally be a bit of a challenge, and I, I tend to rely on the uh, prepackaged distributions of, of Python. So the Nthought, um, Nthought, which is a scientific Python consulting company, they have. A, they have a packaged Python distribution called the Nthought Python distribution, and there's a new similar, um, also very good, and uh, I, I guess a new, new distribution that I'm recommending to a lot of people called called Anaconda from uh, Continuum Analytics, which is a Python distribution which is geared toward um, large-scale data processing. So, so it's great that there are now you know a couple of different um, sort of complete um, packaged distributions that work across platforms and eliminate a lot of the, the headache of having to. Uh, having to, you know, build um, build all, you know, all of the you know, dozens of uh, packages for uh, different packages for, for working with data from source, which is can be can be, can be a bit of a headache you know, doing it across platforms. So uh, within five years, you're seeing a complete shift. Like this is actually a full blown community and lots of opportunity. 
Yeah, I think I think there's there's definitely um, there's definitely a lot of opportunity here, and, and I think some of the um, you know I think I think you know the R community is growing like crazy, um, Python definitely as well. I mean, you see that both in kind of academia and in and in the industry. Um, some of the other like infrastructural tools, things like uh, you know the LLVM project. Uh, is being being used to great you know to, to great effect in many in many other open source projects. There's a new Julia language, you know, which I think uh, you know stands to kill off kill off MATLAB uh, someday, and that would be you know, sort of interesting and uh, potentially very exciting for uh, for a lot of people. Uh, um, and a lot of that's you know it's because that the that the kind of you know the core um, sort of you know you know JIT compilation things like LLVM and also sort of the statistics and sort of machine learning and um, and other sort of open source libraries have matured so that you can really sort of carry out your full stack data wrangling, data preparation through to uh, modeling and analysis um, in, uh, you know, in R, in Python, you know, in all of these things. Um, I'm definitely interested to see, I guess, the next few years to, um, to see more work invested in, in tools for data preparation, data cleaning, data munging, data wrangling, um, because I think there's, you know, historically there's been a lot of work invested in the modeling tools have all been about you know statistical computation and machine learning and sort of dealing with large scale data sets but less less work has been invested in the APIs and for working with data for doing the doing the you know data preparation data cleaning because you know any data scientist will tell you that they spend you know 80% of their their time just getting the data ready for you know inputting into the, the visualization or the um, or the machine learning algorithm and so i think we still have a lot of work to do um, to make those tools better and make them sort of consistently good across languages because it's not just about R, it's not just about Python. Even, you know, R and Python are both great for working with data, but they could still be better. And you know, I'm hopeful that in five or 10 years that it's just a given that um, every language has a robust set of um, easy to use and, uh, um, and high performance uh, data processing algorithms. Well, let's hope so. Maybe we'll see you back in a couple of years and you'll have built that for us. Absolutely. <laughs> Thanks very much, Wes. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me.